You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Welcome to Fresh Hell. I'm Johanna in Austria. I'm Annie in the U.S. Thank you so much for joining us again for your favorite international podcast. I'm very sorry for not being here last week. Johanna did an awesome job. I knew you would. Thank Amazing. you. Amazing. Loved it. But I'm really glad to be back with you today. We, as usual, would like to especially thank our patrons. Thank you to Rita Magdalene Weber. Thank you. I love the name Magdalene, by the way. Yeah, that is a really good name. Thank you to Christina Harmeyer. Hi. And Rachel McGuire. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Jessica Smith. Thanks, Jessica. And finally, Joyce Loveless. Hi, Joyce. Thank you so much. Thank you for each and every one of you who keeps supporting this little podcast of ours in any of the ways. And thank you to everyone who voted for us at the People's Choice Podcast Awards. Uh, we will tell you all about it at the end of this episode. So exciting. So, spooky fuckery season is upon us, Hellions, and just like last year, every episode this month will be creepy, spooky, or hauntingly interesting, we hope. Also, I'd like to mention this right now and not at the very end when half of you are falling asleep. Just like the last two years, our last episode in October is going to be our Halloween special, and this means we want your creepy stories. Do you have ghost stories? Do you live in a haunted house? Do you own a haunted thing? Have you seen a ghost or an alien? Have you seen a UFO? Have you been abducted by aliens? Have you received signs? Yes. Have you received signs from the other side? Have you had premonitions? Did you find something weird, you know, in your floor? Just anything weird. We want to hear about it. So please send us an email, anything to do with the paranormal or unexplainable, and send it to freshhellpodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget to tell us how you want to be addressed in case we read your story in our Halloween episode. For example, Anonymous or Princess Consuela. All right. So today we are going to tell you some of the scariest urban legends from around the world. Some of these may have begun with a grain of truth, but we're fairly sure these are all just scary stories or what the kids today call creepy pastas. I don't know why they had to bring pasta into it. Ah, I I actually know that. I know it. I know it. What is it's it? It's a word mix of creepy, uh, duh, and copy pasta. Is it really that much more complicated to say copy pasted instead of copy pasta? But that's probably just the 79-year-old lady inside of me talking. <laughs> it's like I just found out how old the Golden Girls were when they were filming the Golden Girls. And they're like <laughs> our age. They're yeah, not. I know. It's fine. It makes sense now, at least. I still don't like it, but I understand it. Urban legends are scary or sometimes funny stories that are told as truth for the entertainment or a laugh and a scare. Urban legends differ from legends in that they are more modern stories that usually happen to someone you know or someone you know of because they are a celebrity or one or two degrees from the story. Uh, and they are definitely not true. Yeah, for example, Americans will recognize that Uh, did you know that kid Mikey, who was in that Life cereal commercial as a kid? He ate a bunch of Pop Rocks, you know, that fizzy candy, but then he like drank a ton of Coca-Cola afterward and his stomach exploded and he died. <laughs> It's true. My cousin goes to school with his sister. It was awful. He just blew up like the shark at the end of Jaws. So that's, for example, a, an urban legend. The kid that played Mikey in the Life cereal commercial is alive and well, and he really did like Life cereal, apparently. <laughs> Did you have the Pop Rocks one in Austria? Uh, I think I and probably most people over here only know of this one because of the heavy influence of US TV and movies. Uh, there is also the Mentos with what you over there would call soda, which is also weird because soda here is sparkling water. Oh. That's always challenging my brain a lot, yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no one has actually died eating Pop Rocks or Mentos with soda. So soda is also a regional thing. So where I live in the Northeast, know, we yeah. say soda, you know, but then there's other parts of the U U.S. where they say pop, meaning soda, and then other places where everything's just called Coke. Yeah, we call it lemonade. Lemonade is like Sprite, right? But we call everything lemonade. But, oh, but you call everything lemonade. Okay. See? God, I love this podcast. All right. 
Oh, another <laughs> favorite of mine is, did you know that the song In the Air Tonight is based on a murder that Phil Collins himself witnessed? Wait, do I know that? <laughs> I'm not sure. Ooh. Tell me. Yes, it's great. So the first verse of the song says, Well, if you told me you were drowning, I would not lend a hand. I've seen your face before, my friend, but I don't know if you know who I am. Well, I was there and I saw what you did. I saw it with my own two eyes. And then it goes on and on. Um, and then that deer trips over the playground equipment and keeps on going like nothing happened during the drum solo. <laughs> it's a very niche audience for that joke. But yeah, the true story behind that was what had happened was Phil and a group of friends that he'd known for like ever. They were all out on a camping trip. This was like before he got famous. And Phil was like some distance away when one of his friends fell into the water. And Phil was on like the other side of the lake, so he wasn't close enough to help. But he was absolutely stunned as he watched one of his friends just stand there and do nothing while their mutual friend drowned. Turned out the drowning guy was having an affair with the other man wife. And Phil was too afraid to come forward to say what had happened, but he wrote a song about it. And then, this is the most amazing thing, the man who essentially killed their mutual friend right in front of him came to one of his concerts. Phil got him front row seats and then looked him in the eye and sang that song to him. So now he knows, Phil knows. And Phil knows, he knows, he knows. And Eminem even raps about it in that song, Stan. You know, he says, you know, the song about Phil Collins in the air of the tonight about the guy who could have saved that other guy from drowning but all didn't right. yes. then phil saw it all and let a show he found him yeah all an urban legend so apparently phil collins the very very talented musician was asked to verify if this rumor was true and in the interview he said no he had no idea where all of this had came from and that he wrote the song while going through a very painful divorce it's on the fresh hell mixtape in case you need a re-listen it's on spotify in that playlist. But those are a couple of classic urban legends, right? And I think the main thing with urban legends is it just has to be made up. Like, there could be an inspired by, maybe, but they definitely mm. are not true stories. Well, I have an urban legend about a song as well, which, I don't know, it probably only works for you if you understand German, but I'm gonna try, okay? Okay. So I guess you all know The Wall by Pink Floyd oh, and yeah. the song... Brick in the Wall by Pink Floyd. And you all know the end of the song by Pink Floyd when the children's choir is singing, you know, we don't need no education and so on and so on. If you listen closely, you can actually hear them sing Holin Holin Unters Dach, which translates to bring him, bring him to the attic. And that's not the lyrics of the song. And nobody could explain how this very clear German sentence ended up on the recording. Now, what had happened was that a German sound engineer named Peter Fischer was working on the wall late one night in his studio. And the next morning, nobody could find him. He had simply vanished. A couple of days later, he was found in the attic. He had hung himself. But why? And how is this related to the children choir sing him, you know, bring him, bring him to the attic? Well, when people started to look into the whole story, they found that Peter Fischer used to work at an orphanage as an educator. And he was known among the orphans as a very brutal man who tortured and abused the young children that he should actually take care of. Some of the children even died. At one point, he had quit the job for whatever reason, and he became a sound engineer, and he ended up working on the wall. So that night, when he was working all alone in his studio, he was haunted of the ghosts of the children he had hurt, and they somehow either lured him or made him go up to the attic where he committed suicide. And then the ghostly passage just showed up on the recording and it can still be heard in the song. Oh, that's a good one. And of course, none of this is true. Because actually, if you've never heard this story, you will always hear the children sing, all in all, it's just a... Yeah. Not a brick. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But once you heard this story and you speak German, you will forever and always hear Holin Holin und das Dach. Because that's how our suggestive brain works. I know this story is bogus and I still hear it every single time when I hear that song. Also, I'd like to add that as a kid, the video to Another Brick in the Wall and the artwork of the cover of the Wall Gatefold 2 LP album 
scared the fucking <laughs> crap out of me. Like, how scary was that? The Yeah. And Paul made me watch the film. I'd never seen it. We took April to see Roger Waters do the wall here. And it was amazing. And bringing it back to the German, they performed it at the wall in Berlin in 1990. And I think Paul... It's one of his like deep life regrets was not going to that show. He loves the movie, which I am less fond of, but that's a really, really good one. I've never, I've not heard that one. That was good. Uh, also, I think we should mention that while you sometimes see topics like, you know, Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster listed as urban legends, we are not considering them really urban legends. We list them as cryptid cases and they'll have their own episode, you know, like the Beast of Chivaudan or the Mothman. That's right. Okay, so are we ready to terrify our listeners? Yes, I'd say so. You want me to go first? I'm excited for this. Yeah. So it was one night in the 1980s before cell phones were invented and a woman was driving home alone late at night after leaving work. And she was on a relatively quiet road when she saw headlights behind her in the rear view mirror. Of course, at first she didn't worry at all until suddenly the truck got right up on her rear bumper and turned on its high beams. And thinking that the truck driver wanted her to go faster, she pulled the car closer to the side of the road, you know, so he could safely and easily pass. But he didn't pass, even though there was no one else on the road that night. She had a right turn coming and figured she'd get rid of him then. But when she made the turn, so did the truck. And again, the high beams came on and the truck got so close she was surprised it didn't hit her rear bumper. She's afraid now, a little worried, that maybe this person is following her. So she takes the next left, no longer heading for her own home, just trying to determine if this truck is actually following her or if she's being unreasonably frightened. The truck follows, the high beams come on again and now, palm sweating, she decides to head straight for the local police station. The truck behind her turns its high beams on again, she's now terrified, trying desperately to get to safety. And as she sees the police station up ahead, she unbuckles her seatbelt and gets ready to run. She pulls up next to the station with a screech, flings her door open and sprints inside, yelling for help. She can hear the truck door behind her opening. It's a small police station and the officers immediately rush to her and she explains what happens. And the police walk outside where the truck is now parked behind the car. The truck is now turned off and there is an older man standing next to it. But what's really strange is that the back door of her car is open. At first she thinks maybe the man from the truck was looking to rob her to take her pocketbook that she had left in the car. But when the police approach the man, he explains that he was driving behind her when to his horror he saw a man sit up in the back seat and he could clearly see the outline of a large knife. So he turned on his bright lights which startled the man who dropped down again hiding in her back seat. The man in the truck stayed on her tail, turning on his high beams every time the man with the knife sat up from the back seat. He goes on to explain that when she pulled into the police station, the man leapt from her back seat and ran into the woods across the street. He apologized, saying he couldn't follow because of his bad knee and he couldn't give a good description of the man who was dressed in black with a ski mask over his face. Police searched the woods and found a large knife near the road, which had no prints on it. And the man in her back seat was never found. And that's why it's so important to lock your doors and check your back seats before you get in the car. Oh, God. Okay. So I know that story <laughs> so well. And I've got chills. Every time you hear it, it's like, oh, it's that's the story. That's why I always check my back seat. It's just so crazy. Yes, absolutely the same. And again, that's not the kind of urban legends we had over here when we grew up. So I was already a grown up when I heard this for the first time. But still, I always check Be because it's smart to check. You gotta. I mean, nowadays, your car, you know, it's easier to remind to lock your car when you go to pay at the gas station or something. But back then, in the 80s. Yeah, no automatic yeah. lock. You remember having to say to your friend, hey, lock the door before you close yeah. it. Yeah. Like if you were dropping <laughs> people off. <laughs> uh, things the kids today will never fully appreciate. Our next story. This one is... This is great. They're all so good. Our next story takes place on November 14th, 1995, on a dark and stormy autumn evening in Beijing, China. On this cold, windy night, 
bus number 375 was the last bus of the night, traveling to Fragrant Hills, a beautiful park in the northwest of Beijing. If you ever have the chance to travel to Beijing, Fragrant Hills Park is a very popular tourist attraction in the fall because the colors are absolutely stunning. Apparently, the mountainside is just covered in these red smoke trees that make it look like it's on fire, and the autumn color is beautiful. There's also the Fragrant Hills Hotel, which was designed by I.M. Pei, the famous architect, who passed away in 2019 at the age of 102. He attended MIT here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, my husband's alma mater, and his work is all over the world. You may know the glass pyramid at the Louvre, which is one of his designs, but this ancient parkland and this very interesting hotel is at the final stop for this bus route. Working on the bus that November evening was a driver and a bus conductor who would check the fares or tickets, assist with luggage as needed, and so forth. The bus stopped as usual at the south gate next to the Summer Palace, and a small group of people boarded the bus. The bus continued on its way through the night, and unexpectedly, the driver spots a couple of men ahead flagging the bus down. They're not at a stop, they're just sort of on the side of a busy road, and so the bus driver didn't have to stop for them, but the weather was so terrible that he took pity on them and pulled the bus over. As the two men boarded, they realized that it was actually three men, all dressed strangely, wearing long robes, clothing in the style of the Qing dynasty, which had begun in 1644 and ended in 1912. So, these three men are wearing very old-fashioned clothing, and also... They're very pale, aren't they? The two men seem to be supporting the third between them. His head is hung down, and he seems rather out of it. But the bus driver assumes that they've probably just come from a theatrical performance, which explains their appearance, and the men, perhaps, maybe one has overindulged a bit, and his friends are helping to make sure he gets home safely. In any case, the three new passengers go to the very back of the bus, and they sit down. At the next stop, several passengers get off the bus, and so now the bus is only traveling along with the driver, the conductor, an elderly woman, and a young man. At the back of the bus are the three men that were just picked up on the side of the road. The bus carried on through the night. No one is speaking. Everyone is silent. All you could hear was the hum of the bus engine and the wind outside an open window. Suddenly, the old woman jumps up and accuses the young man of trying to rob her. The young man protests and insists he is innocent, but the elderly woman, while dainty and frail-looking, has a vice-like grip on the young man and insists that the bus pull over so she can take this man to the police. Not one to mess with an old woman, the bus driver pulls the bus over to the side as requested, and the elderly woman and young man exit the bus. As the bus pulls away, the young man is frustrated, tired, and upset at being accused of thievery. He asks the woman where the police station is, because he just wants to get this over with and go home. The old woman responds, There is no police station near here. I just saved your life. The young man tells her he doesn't understand. And the old woman explains, I had a bad feeling about those men when they boarded the bus, and I kept my eyes on them as we traveled. There was a gust of wind that came through when we let those passengers off at the last stop, and as the wind blew through the bus, their robes were lifted, and I could see that they had no legs. Those three men were ghosts. The young man suddenly felt even colder, and his body broke out in a cold sweat, and he realized she was right. Those men didn't look right. And so the two went off and contacted the police, but the police thought it was a prank and dismissed their call. The next morning... Bus 375 was nowhere to be found. It had vanished along with the driver and the conductor. An exhaustive search was conducted by police, but they found no trace of the bus anywhere in the city. The old woman and the young man kept insisting they had seen ghosts on the bus, but they were dismissed. A couple of days later, the bus was found. It was submerged in a reservoir a hundred kilometers or over sixty miles from the Fragrant Hill stop. Inside the bus, were the lifeless, badly decomposed bodies of the bus driver, the conductor, and an unidentified man. The bodies seemed far too decomposed, considering that they had only been dead for at most two days. And who was the third man with long, unkempt hair? When the police looked at CCTV footage of areas around the reservoir, the bus wasn't seen on any of them. How did it get there? And most upsetting, The bus company reported that there shouldn't have been enough fuel in the bus to travel that far. Authorities checked the fuel tank and found it was full of human blood. The deaths of the driver and conductor were never explained, and the third body on the bus has never been identified. 
Perhaps the man being helped by the other two had already been dead the entire time. And that is the story of Beijing's ghost bus. Oh, I thought it was so creepy. It's unusual for a story to have a really specific location yeah. other than a country of origin. So that one is, uh, that's, that's a fun one. If that story creeped you out as much as it did us, then here are some of the reasons it's an urban legend. The bus number changes depending on the story. Sometimes it's an old man and not an old woman who gets the younger man off the bus. Some stories say that they never found the bus at all. Another story says that rather than three creepy men, it was one terrifying lady in red. I mean, why are you going to send three male ghosts to do the job one lady <laughs> ghost can manage? In a gown and high heels, probably, right? Also, like the first story, there just aren't any reputable sources that mentioned a missing bus or any of this happening. It's just a really great urban legend. So if you have information on it that we missed or you know this legend, please let us know about it in our Facebook group or on Instagram because we love these stories. Yes, we really do. Okay, the next story has similar versions in different parts of the world, but the story essentially goes like this. A couple goes out to dinner and they have a lovely meal, and when they return home they were alarmed to see that their dog is sort of coughing a little bit. And they can't tell because it sort of seems like he's making a choking sound, but if you're a dog owner you know that's the kind of noise a dog makes when he's coughing. Yeah. But you know, they want to be sure. And so the wife calls her friend who works at an emergency veterinary clinic. The vet says to go ahead and bring the dog in right away, just in case he did swallow a toy or something and he's choking. And so she and her husband get the dog into the car, which isn't easy because it's a good sized dog, you know, like Opus, for example. And while he usually loves the car, they're having an unusually hard time getting the dog into the car and figure he must know they're going to the vet. When they get there, they say they're going to take a look and probably keep him overnight, but they'll call if there's anything else. And they tell them that the best thing to do is, you know, head home in the meantime and get a couple of hours of sleep. And so now they're at home and they've just started getting ready for bed and the phone rings. It's her friend at the vet's office and she says, listen to me, the two of you need to get out of the house immediately. Please listen to me. Get your husband and get out now. I've called the police and I'm on my way. And then the line goes dead. Stunned, but knowing her friend wouldn't choke about something like this, she tells her husband that they need to get out immediately. And so they go out into the road in ropes and slippers. And they're just standing there in the road really worried about the dog. Because maybe he had had a reaction to something toxic in their house. They don't know what's going on and they are just starting to feel a bit foolish about the entire situation when they hear a siren. Before long they see vehicles with emergency lights and multiple police cars approaching their home. An officer gets out of the car and tells them they need to stay here please and a group of police enters the house weapons drawn. But no one will explain what's happening. Suddenly she sees her friend's car speeding down the street. Terrified something has happened to the dog and looking for answers she runs to her friend who says I'm so glad you're okay. Your dog was choking on a finger. And there's another finger in his stomach. I called the police immediately. Horrified. They now look toward their house. And the wait is forever. Finally, police come out of the house and they have a man handcuffed. His one hand wrapped in a towel. A monogrammed towel from their master bathroom. The police had finally caught the serial murderer who had been on the loose for years hiding underneath the bed they were about to get into. Oof. Spooky. It's so spooky. <laughs> Even when you know it's still so spooky. Good dog. None of it's true. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure certain aspects of it have happened, but not quite in that dramatic. My kind of Daniela plant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Such a good one, though. We wish it was true. It, it just it isn't. But it's a good urban legend. It's a really good one. Oh, yeah. So good. And as we said, they can't be true, but I have to tell our listeners, just sorry. Sometimes you find something, at the people who hate all the sidebars are going to hate this, so just skip ahead a minute or two. But I love this so much. It's the favorite information I learned this year, I think. So when we were researching stories that we might not know as well, one of the things I found was this Australian urban legend that apparently there's a golf course in Queensland, Australia, and that in 1996, during a very, very heavy rainstorm and really, really serious flooding, bull sharks, bull sharks, were washed into the lake at the golf course and then stranded there when the water receded. And so... 
Now, there are a dozen bull sharks, again, motherfucking bull sharks, bull sharks, living in the water hazard of a golf course in Australia. And people get eaten all the time. Every time someone goes to retrieve a ball, it's like, whoop, out, out comes Jaws and <laughs> bye bye And I was like, oh, this one's fucking great. It's like a real-life Sharknado scenario seen down under. I mean, people getting eaten, obviously, that's not great. But just the story as an urban legend is fan-fucking-tastic. So I'm like, this is great. Bull sharks on a golf course. So I searched for some more information to get the different variations of this urban legend. And the problem was, it's not an urban legend. What's up, Australia? (laughs) There is a golf course with bull sharks in the water hazard there. No one's been eaten, again, that I could find. I guess that's the part that makes it an urban legend, but the rest is true. There is a golf course called Carbrook, and their lake has like a dozen 10-foot-long bull sharks who are thriving. The lake has fish in it. And then one of the articles I read said that the employees just sometimes throw meat in just to make sure the sharks are growing and happy. And they are. And they're even having baby sharks. And this is why I love Australia so much. It's just, oh, around every corner is some kind of creature waiting to get you, but also the cutest animal. So you have to take your chances. If I've learned one thing from watching the Crocodile Dundee movies, which I know are very, very accurate, I mean, they might as well just put Ken Burns' name on the front, run it in black and white, and call it a day. Just don't go near the water in Australia or Africa. Any other place in the world, there's probably lots of them, but those are the two I'm most aware of. Alligators, crocodiles, hippopotamuses, which it's not hippopotami, seems like it should be. It's not. It's hippopotamuses, bull sharks, all bad news. Have you seen the show River Monsters? I have. It's terrifying. (laughs) If you're golfing, don't put your hand in the water. That's all I'm saying. I bet when Toto blessed the rains down in Africa, they didn't know said rains might provide bull sharks with access to places they ought not be. Not that I'm bitter about it. I really am unnecessarily upset about these sharks on this golf course, but sharks on a golf course. In water. Yeah. Speaking of water, water, to make a smooth transition here. Nice one. (laughs) (laughs) I picked the next one out just for you, Annie. It's a toilet ghost, a terrifying toilet ghost. That's where the water comes in. Oh, the Facebook group's going to be so excited. I mean, if it was just a water-wasting kind of ghost, we wouldn't be discussing it, would we? So this is the story of Japan's Hanako-san, or Miss Hanako of the toilet. And here's how the story goes. Hanako was a young girl attending elementary school during World War II. One day in school, the air raid sirens went off. But Hanako was scared. She ran to the bathroom while the rest of her classmates followed the teacher to the bunker. Terrified, Hanako hid in the third bathroom stall and was killed instantly when the school took a direct hit during the bombing. And now young girls all over Japan know the story of Hanako-san and they warn their friends about her because she can appear in any school bathroom. And girls challenge each other to find her. To meet her, you must go to the girls' bathroom, alone, on the third floor if possible. And go to the third stall. It won't work if it isn't the third stall. Knock three times on the door and ask, Hanako-san, are you there? If she's there, she will answer back in a quiet, childlike voice, Yes, I am. The bathroom stall door will then open on its own, probably creaking, just a little bit. And if you're brave enough to look through the space, you'll see a young girl wearing red with her hair pulled into an old-fashioned bun. If you're lucky, she won't speak anymore and you can leave. But she might ask you if you want to be friends, which sounds lovely, right? But is in fact very, very bad. Because if you say yes, she will grab you and pull you through the toilet with her as she goes back to hell, trapping your soul with hers for eternity. And if you say no... It seems Hanako doesn't take rejection well because she will cut you to pieces, leaving your body for your friends waiting outside to find when they become worried. Oh, man, that's brutal. I agree. Toilet to hell is... It's always damned if you do, damned if you don't with toilet ghosts, though, isn't it? I mean, definitely. I love this story, though. It's so creepy. It reminds me a lot of Bloody Mary, which Mm. terrified me as a kid. 
I assumed, we both, I think, assumed everybody listening to this knows Bloody Mary. If you don't let us know and we'll include this, we'll include it when we do another one of these episodes because this one's actually been fun. So there are a lot of different versions of the story from simple innocuous things like, you know, her hair was in a bun or bob. Uh, She was wearing a red dress or a skirt. Yeah. And I love how the options are bun or neat bob and never long, crazy toilet ghost hair. Like, (laughs) I thought that was like the number one thing of toilet ghosts, which is like what my hair looks like when it's down. That's how I'm now going to describe my own hair. Like toilet ghost hair, like in the ring, which I've never seen because the ad scared me too much. (laughs) But not Hanako. She's tidy, neat and tidy. It's not only the hair, so bigger aspects than toilet ghost hair are also disputed depending on who tells the story. For example, the way Hanako died. Some stories say that she was murdered in the bathroom by a trusted adult. Really any death works as long as it's untimely and horrifically tragic. Yeah. And she's not always portrayed as scary. Apparently sometimes she's said to protect you from even scarier bathroom ghosts. Other tellings say that you might see a bloody or ghostly hand closing the bathroom door again. Or it's possible that when the door opens, a giant three-headed lizard will eat you for invading Hanako's privacy. So this is a very popular story in Japan. And if you're a fan of anime or manga, you may already be familiar with Hanako. And two Japanese horror films have been made about this legend as well. I have to say, Japan has some of the best ghost stories. All Asia actually do, but Japan is really chef's kiss. Yeah, I can't. I watch the previews for them, the coming attraction. (laughs) I can't. That's as far as I can get. I'm still a real wimp. But I have to agree with you because, yeah, I still haven't watched any of them. I'm too scared. (laughs) All right. Mm. Yes, our next story has also happened in some form or another all over the world. And this story goes like this. One night, a man was driving down a quiet, rural road, you know, the kind with nothing but fields and woods for miles. It was really in the middle of nowhere, and so he was surprised when he saw a hitchhiker. But she looks like a nice young woman, and she's alone, so he pulled over and told her to get in the car and asked where he could take her. So she replies that she only needed to travel a few miles up ahead, and she thanked him for the ride. She then warned him about the curve in the road up ahead, cautioning him that it was sharper than it appears and had been the cause of many accidents. He thanked her for the warning, and after the curve, he looks into the rearview mirror to thank her again. But she's gone. Turned out, she was the ghost of a woman who was killed in an accident on that very curve. And now, she appears in the car, or as a hitchhiker to warn others, to keep them from the same fate. Ooh. I mean, if she appears suddenly in the car, that's not gonna be very good for, you know, avoiding accidents. No, that that would do you a real startle. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of variations on this one. We even have an Austrian version that I told last October in the Austrian Ghosts episode. I also know a Mexican version that is very, very similar. Speaking of Austrian versions, I have a story from Vienna for you. We have a lot of creepy folk legends and some not so creepy, like, for example, riding on the devil's giant cock to get home in time to prevent your (laughs) wife from marrying another man. Totally normal. Yeah. But we barely have any good urban legends. And then I remembered this one. In Vienna, we have a really great public transportation. With a single ticket for two euros 40, you can use streetcars, subways and buses to get to your destination. A bus, streetcar or subway train usually comes every three to five minutes. And if you have to wait for more than five minutes, you can hear people loudly complaining or they actually make something like, tss, tss. We are truly spoiled in Vienna when it comes to public transportation. Let's say it like this. Nowadays, you find 98 subway stations and some of them are actually really beautiful because they were designed by the famous Art Nouveau architect Otto Wagner. Another important station is that at the Stephansdom and that's the center of the city. And when you step on the escalator and ascend back to the city surface, you're right in front of the cathedral. But what is this? When you step out of the train and before you go up to the cathedral, you might smell something rotten. Yes, it very clearly smells horribly foul down in the station, like sulfur or maybe, maybe like something decomposing. The reason why is because when the subway station was built in the late 1970s, 
Some of the construction workers died because of some horrible accident. Unfortunately, their bodies could not be rescued and so the workers are still down there. In the depths of the subway station, concrete poured on top of them and they are slowly rotting away. Or maybe they were actually sacrificed so that the construction would be under a lucky star and work could be finished without any major problems. Something that I should have considered for the renovation of our house, maybe? I don't know. Maybe, yeah. Or is it a huge rat colony with rats dying all over the place in the walls of the station? Ew. Actually, no, not one version of the story is true, because the reason for the foul sulfuric smell is way more trivial. In order to be even able to build this subway station, they needed to use a special organic chemical to solidify the underground enough so that, you know, everything would be stable. Otherwise, the weight of the cathedral on top would have been too heavy for the hollowed out underground and everything could have just caved in. You don't want that. No, that would be bad. On hot days, the chemical reacts with the heat and produces the foul smell. And that's what you still can smell on some hot summer days. It's not rotting and decomposing bodies, thank God. Yeah, thankfully. It just smells like Florida water. That's a good one. That's a really good one. All right. Well, those are all of our urban legends for today's episode. And a reminder, they're all false. None of them are true. Yeah. We'd love to hear from you, hear some of your urban legends. And all right. I think our something good this week is probably the same something good, right? I'd say so too. I think so. Yeah. Tell them. (laughs) We won an award. We won. We were nominated. We didn't think we'd get nominated. Yeah. So the top 10, we didn't think we'd make it into the top 10 who were nominated. And so 8.2 million people, I guess, voted for the first round. And we had made it into the top 10 for that. And then the second round, you had to be invited. So I think 10,000 people who voted in the first round And then another 500 were voted, uh, they were chosen from the podcasting community. So 10,000 were listeners and the other 500 were other podcasters and podcasting hosts and that kind of stuff. And we were nominated in True Crime and Best Female Hosted. And I think we can agree that we didn't think we stood a chance. I mean, we didn't even think we we would get nominated because we didn't make it last year. And so we didn't even check no, we didn't. when the nominations came out, which is typical for us. That's true. We just assumed we didn't. And one of didn't. our listeners wrote to us like, oh my God, you're nominated. And we're like... We really? are. <laughs> we are nominated? We are. Okay. okay. It was. <laughs> and we were nominated against really big shows. Uh, yeah. So we lost Best True Crime to... Yeardley Smith and Small Town Dicks. Which, I mean, yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Of course we did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that kind, of, that kind of explains to you just the caliber of the shows that we were nominated with is amazing. What was funny for me is that we watched together. We, we did. Watched, I got up at three o'clock in the morning so that we could watch this podcast award Together, yes. where we thought we don't have a chance anyway. No, no. And then what happened is that my stream was always a couple of seconds early. Like, I always told you something. You were like 10 seconds ahead. And you were like, what? I didn't see that. And I were like, oh. So I knew I was ahead of you. <laughs> and then comes our category, best female hosted. And I think some... some head of audio from Linktree read out all the nominees. Yes, he did a great job. He sponsored, they were the sponsors for our categories. And then he's like, and the winner is Fresh Hell Podcast. (laughs) And I was like, what? (laughs) What? What? No. And I couldn't write to Annie immediately because obviously I didn't want to tell her before she sees it. So apparently Paul could see it because he saw, he was reading everybody's the what people were writing, but I wasn't reading it. I was just watching. Obviously, well, you can tell because the minute he saw it, he started recording me, which I didn't realize at first. And then I was like, "Oh yeah, this is great because I'm here. I am in my sweatpants eating <laughs> rice cakes, and <laughs> you know, um, 
And I had said to Johanna earlier, like, should we get dressed up and like watch it? And we were like, no, it's ridiculous. We're not going to win. <laughs> so there's a great video of Paul, of me, when they say that we won. And I'm just, and then I'm just staring at it, the TV in shock, I think. <laughs> and Paul kept saying, you won. And I kept going, no, <laughs> no, no. I no. loved it when you kept saying, what just happened? What just happened? <laughs> no. He's like, you won. No, <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> So, wow, this is, it's our first trophy. It's our first ever, ever. Not not just with a podcast ever, for me, at least. Well, I did, Paul, Paul thinks that I used to be in a, like a show choir that won a couple of trophies, but they weren't my trophies. Do you know what I mean? They were the school's yeah. trophies. I was just a very small part in a large choir. This is definitely something that we did, you know? I don't know. It's yeah. wild. And they look like really pretty trophies. Yeah. Can't wait to get my hands on them. I know. I'll show you all. It's so exciting. Congratulations to all the other winners. Some really great shows. Really, really great shows. And really, congratulations to everybody who was nominated. Yeah. We, I don't, you know, when we didn't get nominated last year, when we didn't make it through, I don't think I understood then how hard it is actually to make it through. And I have a better understanding of that now. So really, congratulations to all the nominees. Well, last year, after we didn't get nominated, we were like, well, we didn't want it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it turns out we really want it. No, it's great. It's very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who voted for us. We just, I still don't know what to say. All right, guys, that's it for this week's episode with this award-winning international podcast of ours. If you like this episode or any of our other episodes, please, please do us the huge favor and go to your podcast app and check if you can leave us a rating and or review. It really, really makes our day. Uh, you can also check out our Patreon. Go to patreon.com and type in Fresh Hell Podcast. We pop right up or go to our webpage, freshhellpodcast.com. There you also find the link to Patreon, to our Facebook group, which is amazing. Such Again, a nice group of people. Kiss. Yeah, they're just the best. Our merch store, our email, our PO box, everything you need to know. What else? Yes, please. Again, don't forget, send us your Halloween stories to freshhellpodcast at gmail.com because we really want to hear them and we want to read them to you for Halloween. Tell your pets we said hi. All the dogs who bite off fingers, all the cats <laughs> who scratches out the eyes of the intruders all the bull sharks in the golf course all the bull sharks all the guinea pigs all the alligators in the sewer bite your toes <laughs> all of them <laughs> we know we had a couple of pet crossing over the rainbow bridge the last couple of weeks yeah. and we're sorry we love you we hug you we're here for you we've also got lots of animals on the other side waiting for your animals so it's all good it's gonna be okay And uh, yeah, if you yourself are going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye. <laughs>